Good evening, everyone. I'm Hugh Hewitt, and you're joining us at the Kirby Center, Hillsdale College's Washington Lantern. They are here, and they have been here for many years, and I'm joined for the seventh year in a row by Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College, Kathleen O'Toole. Dr. O'Toole is the assistant provost at Hillsdale College for K-12 education, and annually we gather in December to do a teletown hall on reviving American classical K-12 education. Tonight we meet on a very auspicious day, Dr. Arn. It's the birthday of one of the people about whom you've spent most of your adult life thinking. Yeah, I met my wife studying Winston Churchill in Oxford, England, and today is his 148th birthday. And what did he have to say about education? Uh, well, he, uh, Winston Churchill almost never said anything that was not beautiful, and everything is, he said about education was, and I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, this, this concerns adult education. It's from 1953, the second time he was prime minister. And they'd started up adult education, never, never done it before. And he held it up because what they wanted to teach, the education ministry wanted to teach adults was hobbies and new jobs and stuff like that. And he made them change the curriculum. And here's what he says. How many must there be in Britain after the disturb disturbance of two destructive wars who thirst in later life to learn about the humanities, the history of their country, the philosophies of the human race, and the arts and letters which sustain and are borne forward by the ever-conquering English language. I guess that's a bit chauvinistic, but it's still conquering. This ranks, in my opinion, far above science and technical in instruction, which, however, must be well sustained. The mental and moral outlook of free men studying the past with free minds in order to discern the future demands the highest measures which are hard-pressed finances can sustain. In other words, you should teach kids what it is to be human. And if what you do instead is what we do increasingly today and what every totalitarian society does, which is try to make them into something, we forget that they already are something. They are humans. And Dr. O'Toole, you, both you and Dr. Arn received your PhDs from Claremont Graduate School studying Aristotle with great students and scholars of Aristotle. So they, you've been thinking about education for a long time. What is classical education? Since that is in your job title, I want to know what you think it is. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a new-ish name for something that's very old. Classical education is just liberal education. It's well-rounded education. It's an education in all of the subjects that someone ought to know about in order to be able to understand the human world and the natural world. In, in other words, to just be able to make sense of what it means to be a human being. It begins with the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic. Uh, it includes instruction in character, um, because after all, you're not in school just to fill your mind with a bunch of facts. You're in school to become the adult that you're going to become. And so we should be talking about making good choices and um, what it means to be a person of, of character, of substance. Now, each week, Dr. Arnold and I talk on the Hillsdale Dialogue on the radio about, before we go on the air, about our grandchildren, respectively. Yeah. We're observing education as it unfolds in real time. And what has your two-year-old granddaughter taught you, Dr. Arnold, about education? Well, uh, you know, so... Alongside your boxer, I might add. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, so we have dogs and boxers. We've had them forever, my wife and me. And, uh, you know, Dr. O'Toole is the next generation after us, and she has two children. And they're doing the same thing she did, and the boxers are doing the same thing their predecessor boxer did. The children are learning to talk. Nobody's teaching them. They're just listening to us intently and doing all the work, whereas the boxers also listen to us intently, and they never start talking because they're stupid. And they're not, and they're not. Human. They're good dogs, but they're not going to learn they're how to talk. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not good dogs. <laughs> but they're not human. They don't, they don't have speech and they never will. And so what does the classical education do for a two-year-old or a six-year-old or a 10-year-old that public education that we understand writ large is the model in America today doesn't do? Well, it teaches you to be yourself. Like he said earlier, your classical education is not trying to turn you into a particular thing. It's trying to identify what do you need to know because you are human, which you are, which everyone is, and then give you the tools that you need in order to become a well-rounded person 
who can then go on to do something specific after that. So it's not career training, um, and it's it's also not um, it's also not geared toward thinking about the place that a, that a child is going to fill in society later. You know that where it's not for the state; it's for the human being, right, and the citizen, which which means which is a sort of larger, more important role than someone who is merely just filling a filling a role for the state. So more than a decade and a half ago, a fellow named Steve Barney, who I've never met, you'll have to tell me about Mr. Barney, came to you as the head of the college and said, we need to do something. And so what did he want done and what have you done since then? And what does Dr. O'Toole do in pursuit of whatever Dr. Arn and Steve Barney discussed all those years ago? Uh, Steve Barney was a trustee of the college. He's retired from that now. But he's an extremely attractive character. Uh, he was in the f financial world. He made some good money. But the big thing about him was he gets worked up around high things and he cries. He cries all the time. He's a blubber baby. And one night in Florida at his home, he started thumping me on the chest and pointing at a school across the street from his house. And he said, those kids over there are not learning anything and they're losing their opportunity for a good life. And then bump, bump, bump in my chest, you have to fix that. And I said, well, you know, I've thought of something. And uh, it, uh, see, if, if you know some elements of education, uh, the first line of Aristotle's metaphysics is, the human being stretches himself out to know. If you're just around any kid and talk to the kid, they'll be extremely interested unless they've been ruined by somebody. And, and so they, they need to learn. And what do they need to learn? Only human beings read, write, and compute. They are synonyms for human reason. And so they need to get good at those things. And then if, once they get good at those things, as they get good at those things, the world is their oyster. They can learn anything. And it's a wonder to behold as a grandparent. It's, a, it's not so wonderful as a parent. There you're busy, but it's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. From, from that conversation with Steve Barney, with Dr. Arn, Dr. O'Toole, what has sprung? What is the, uh, the Hillsdale well, Initiative today? We have the K-12 Education Office, and through the work of that office, we teach schools and prospective school founders how to bring this type of education to their communities. We have shepherded along... Uh, the founding of you know many dozens of charter and private schools across the country. We provide teacher training for those schools. We provide curriculum. We provide conferences for their board members, for their principals. And we're kind of helping local people come together and then providing them with a network through which they can learn with and from each other and from the professors at Hillsdale College about what classical education is, what should be done in a K through 12 school. And how many of them are there now? When we talk about public charter schools, first of all, what is a charter school? So a charter school is a public school. Um, it's, a, it's a public school concept that was started in the 90s. And the idea was we're going to have public schools tuition free, no admission requirements. And we're going to let those schools innovate somehow, do something different than what the, the typical public school is doing. And the thought was we can learn from that innovation. And so charter schools are all over the country, and they're, um, they're schools of choice, meaning a parent would decide to send their child there. They wouldn't be zoned for that type of school the way that they would for a public. And um, charter schools are for all kinds of specific types of curricula and specific types of students, um, high-achieving students, students who are in dropout recovery programs. They have all kinds of charter schools. Our charter schools are classical charter schools. And what they bring is a return to the excellence that was present in American public education back to America's public schools. Now, you must be more excited than any of the previous six years because Arizona and West Virginia have adopted <laughs> universal school choice. Yeah. And funding will now follow the, the student. Yes. And Arizona already has many fine public charters. And I don't know if you have an academy down there, Hillsdale. There are many excellent charter er, schools in Arizona. But this is going to spread. I, I spoke today with state legislators from Iowa, and they're super majorities, and they're going to do it too. Mm -hmm. And there are other schools. You must be so excited because this is like the blossoming of a second golden era in American education. Well, I hope so. I mean, it's a, it's a big... School choice is a big topic right now, and I, what we saw in the last election is that people are resoundingly for school choice. Parents are very concerned about what their children are learning in schools. 
what they saw during COVID was that, you know, on those Zoom screens that those poor kindergartners were forced to look at, the things that they expected were happening in the classroom were actually not happening at all. And this idea that the experts know what they're doing suddenly seemed maybe not quite to be true. Uh, meanwhile, parents are forced to homeschool, you know, themselves, and they start realizing, wait a minute, you know, I know a thing or two about this. In, in our schools, we teach, we teach that parents are the primary educators of their children. And any parent knows you know your kid better than anyone ever could, and you love your kid more than anyone. If, in fact, you are a parent, you are a homeschooler. Uh, well, you just don't know <laughs> well, whether that you're a homeschooler. This, we read this book, The Art of Teaching by Gilbert Hyatt, and the, one of the points of it is that you, if you are concerned with young people, you are teaching, even, even with adults, right? We're teaching each other. We're explaining things to each other. And so there is an art of teaching, and there is such a thing as a classroom teacher who is dedicated to that art and refining it. But parents know a thing or two about about their kids, and um, they should be given the opportunity that charter schools give, which is the opportunity to, to decide, is this curriculum right for my child? Now, I want to get two important things done. There are tens of thousands of people listening to us, and the video of this will be downloaded to hillsdale.edu as soon as it's over. But if people want to contribute to a one-for-one -one match, which we do every year, the match amount has gone up to one million six hundred and fifty thousand dollars so if anyone out there wants to write a one million six hundred and fifty thousand dollar check we will match that tonight or you can call triple eight four three seven thirty nine forty one triple eight four three seven thirty nine forty one alternatively you can give at hillsdale.edu slash town hall if you want to ask a question and there are tens of thousands of people on the line you've got to listen to this very closely hit star three you know asterisk on your star three to get in the queue to ask a question if you don't get uh, through tonight by the way just stay on the line and leave it and they'll get back to you but i do want to point out we're raising money for this initiative for all of these schools 73 i believe spread across the united states and more every day Triple eight four three seven thirty nine forty one. 437 Dr. Arn, I want to ask you about the 1776 curriculum before we go to the phones. And I know that we, we got to get to the phones in about one minute. What is the 1776 curriculum from? What did it grow and how important is it in your view? Uh, well, it's a civics curriculum. And what it grew from is <clears throat> 60 years of work that I've been involved with by my teachers and others who set out to recover the meaning of America. And... It, it got a name because Donald Trump founded a 1776 commission, and I was the chairman of that. And we wrote a paper about what kids need to learn and how to teach them. And, and the, we, we've named the civics section of our curriculum, and we have a complete curriculum for every grade. We've been spending 10 years doing it. But the civics part is called 1776 because that's the year the country began. And, and uh, it's beautiful and it's people always say is it slanted toward america or against it and the answer is no tell what happened america is a beautiful story it's a human story of course there are failures in it and so you have to talk about those you have to explain them you have to explain the standard by which you understand them to be failures, that standard would be found in the Declaration of Independence. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's the best civics curriculum in the country, I think, because it's written by people who have deep, deep knowledge of it, and it's tested in schools now for getting on for a decade, and it works. I, I just want it to spread like kudzu across the United States because, boy, do we have a civics gap. And I'm sure you don't have a civics gap in the Hillsdale Charter Schools and the schools which you advise. But, boy, that is an important part of the, tonight's conversation. Okay, lots of people want to talk to us. My first question is going to be a, uh, a question. Live caller, John Cavalier in Miami, Florida, has a question about how classical schools prepare students for the future. If you're in line and you want to get a question and hit star three to ask a question, Joan Cavalier in Miami. Miami, Florida. You're on the line with Dr. Arn and Dr. O'Toole. Hi there, Dr. Arn and the group. Uh, we, I appreciate the Hillsdale bulletins that I get every month or so. And I'm a, a, a person of classical education. I went to liberal arts college. And I feel it helps prepare you for life. Uh, that's just a general statement, but I, through my years, I'm 82. 
I have seen the benefits of a classical education. Well, Joan, you're not going to get much so of a disagreement. My question, though, Go ahead. Is how do we help these kids that are growing up now in the living in the world to to survive financially? Because that's what most of the emphasis is. How do I get a good job? Great question, Dr. O'Toole. In the course of learning a classical education, will you be equipped to make a living? There is no better preparation for the necessities of life and for the fundamental things of life than, than a classical education, and here's why. If you, if you go through the curriculum at a Hillsdale Classical School, you are going to be a reader, in most cases, by the second half of kindergarten. You're going to study mathematics in a way that gives you a deep understanding of what's going on when you do simple calculations and then more complex calculations. You're not going to be just copying the math. Uh, you're going to learn cursive. You're going to learn to form your thoughts carefully, both in speech and in writing. And it all culminates in a senior thesis project where you take a look at the things that you have studied kindergarten through 12th grade, and you choose a book that teaches you about, teaches us about human nature and the human good, and you give a presentation about that to your teachers, to your, um, to your fellow students, to younger students. And so you culminate your education teaching others and kind of taking stock of all of the things that you have learned. I started one of these schools, and I have watched every student who graduated from that school go through that process and turn into the type of person who is ready to engage in the world, you know, confident, someone who knows themselves, someone who is curious about, about the world and able to continue learning even though they're not in formal K-12. You know, I went into a, a classical school, not one of the Hillsdale ones, but in Arizona, and the 12th graders were reading the Brothers Karamazov, and they were having a conversation. And I thought, these kids are like, 14th grade, 16th grade, and they were seniors. And it's because they had learned year in and year out how to talk and how to listen. And Dr. Arn, I've been with you in the cafeteria at Hillsdale College, where all of these students are prepared to talk, to listen, and to ask questions. To me, that is the essence of a classical education, to be peripatetic and ready to learn at any moment. Well, the glory, so, you know, I have good things to say about Hillsdale College. And, uh, if you come to visit the college, come just find out if I'm in town. It's known far in advance. And I'll take you to the dining hall, and we'll sit down with a bunch of them. And we'll beat the tar out of them. That's great fun. And it's, you know, and like uh, at Hillsdale, you'll be joshing around, and then somebody brings up a serious subject. And everybody sits up straight. Now we're going to work. And they, it's the time flies. It's awesome. Yeah, so that's classical education, though. That and is, that is that's it, right. You'll get hired. In fact, we are in the heart of D.C., which is slowly. Can I give the secret out that you're taking over Washington, D.C. with classically educated kids? I mean, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. they're, they are like kudzu in Washington, D.C., because they are of great use to anyone who is interested in governing. Why is that? Well, uh, you know, if you – we don't prepare anybody for a job interview except we spend – all of elementary school and high school doing that. And so the kids who graduate from Hillsdale College, I mean, first of all, it's very difficult to get into Hillsdale College these days, but they work really hard. They're expected to be virtuous people, that is, courageous, moderate, uh, just, and wise. And they're supposed to practice those things, and they do. And so you get a chance to hire one of them, and people just marvel at you. And is that the case in the in the charter schools as well, Dr. O'Toole? Are they learning to be just and wise and moderate and courageous? Yeah, by the time you've spent the high school years alone, you know, at, at, at a minimum, maybe the entire K through 12 sequence, if you're lucky, you are a serious person. You're a person of substance. You've thought about some hard questions. You've come to understand yourself. You've confronted your limits. Uh, you've made you know, serious choices based on 
you know, your your experience with a talented faculty who's kind of shepherding you along, but also all of these great works that we read, which teach you deep, important things about human life. And so if you've been successful in these in one of these schools, you are ready for the world and a person who can do a lot of good. I have world. a lot of questions, but I want to go back to the to the phone. Star three, if you want to get a call in. Jet Jill is calling from Lexington, South Carolina. Jet, you're on with Dr. O'Toole and Dr. Arn. Please, what's your question? Yes, my question is, what is the role of the classroom teacher, no matter the grade level, what do you imagine and see the classroom teacher doing as instruction is going on and as the children are learning? What, what do you see them doing? The teacher is leading. It is a teacher-led classroom. Sometimes today you get this idea that, um, you know, teachers are there to kind of be the coach on the side the guide on the side, they say, you know, well, this, and in other words, the student is doing the learning himself or herself, usually from a textbook or something, and the teacher's there like cheering them on. No, no, no. If you walk into the classroom at any of our affiliated schools, the teacher will be at the front of the room, the teacher will be leading a conversation, and the teacher, if you look at that person's resume, they're someone who has experienced this type of education themselves. They're deeply knowledgeable about the subject that they're teaching. If when I was running a school and I needed to hire a history teacher, I would look for history majors and then I would look at their transcripts and I would look at the courses they had taken and their grades in those courses because that is the first question. Do they know? Do they know what they're going to be teaching? And then the second question is, can they and do they want to explain it to, and do they have the talent to explain it to young people? Those are the types of people that we hire. And what it, what it yields is a classroom where, you know, it's very productive. It's very inspiring. We're teaching bell to bell. Um, What's that mean, bell to meaning, bell? Meaning we, the class begins and we are working. And then we, we're, we're, the teacher is still teaching right at the very end. There's not a lot of group work. There's not a lot of projects. There's not a lot of, there's no technology in the classroom except maybe that the teacher is using to display maps or things, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a productive classroom where students are reading books and talking and taking notes and learning real things. And you made because a point of that, Dr. O'Toole. No technology in the classroom. What an antithetical statement to make oh my to gosh, everything it's we so found important. COVID. I sit here with my iPad, but it's, it's important. Um, think about, I mean, we're all, we're all of the age where we can remember what it was like to not have a cell phone on us all the time. Although you have always <laughs> Dr. had some Arthur type of me, you had we, the Palm we, Pilot in nineteen ninety something we didn't or whatever. Have a TV but, for a while. <laughs> but, but with you accepted, you know, you can remember what your attention yeah. span was like before you had the iP Apple Watch and all that stuff. Well, think what it does to children, oh. right? And we convince ourselves that it's possible to, you know, use the iPad to, you know, encounter to help the student encounter things that they wouldn't normally encounter, or whatever. Listen, I remember being in school. I teach students. They do not do what they're supposed to do on the iPad. It's a massive distraction. And there's no replacement when it comes to actually learning, meaning getting something in your mind and letting it affect you deeply. There's no replacement for an actual conversation with an actual human being. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we don't do cell phones. We don't do iPads. We don't do unnecessary technology in the schools. And in many of them, you know, if the students even have a cell phone on them, then it's taken away until the end of the day because it's only going to be a hindrance to the learning and to the conversation that needs to be happening. Uh, Doctor, on a comment, I, I think that's so great. But I, if you have a contrary opinion, feel free to. No, no, it uh, the, you you learn. It's actually true that the learning is in the student and the teacher leads. The student has to concentrate for hours every day. And you never learn any important thing unless you're straining to learn it. Right. And so you have to focus, yeah. you see. I, I have a point to make, which is, have you ever seen an athletic team train with cell phones on them? Yeah. Have you ever seen a football team or a basketball team? And you have great sports at Hillsdale College. So I assume you, you, you go and see as many. Do the wrestlers ever have an iPhone with them when they're being taught by their coach? The answer is no. They're never, ever engaged. Off, off, off the field, great. But I think what you made is a point. Is that de rigor for a Hillsdale affiliated school? Oh yeah, I'm there's, so glad to hear that. There's this book called. It's got a. It's got a kind of intimidating title for kids, but it's called "Study Is Hard Work," and it's about how to be a student. And the first chapter is called "Learning to Listen," 
And it's a great book that I always recommend to teachers because it teaches you how to teach study skills to the, or, you know, the habits of being a student. Right. Um, and right. the, po the point he makes is listening is an active state and you have to, it's a muscle that you have to train, you know, to sit through. Do you remember being in college or high school and having to sit through a 50 minute class where the teacher was explaining something complicated and, you know, making a sustained argument over time? That takes work. Algebra requires yeah, concentration. Right, right. That's why the leader teacher is important because as you get your education, you never know the next step. Somebody has to show it to you, yeah. but then you have to do it, right? And that means that uh, you should go to uh, the kindergarten teacher at, at my daughter's former school is Mrs. Rarden. She's the greatest teacher I ever saw. And these kindergartners come, and you know, they're little wigglers, right? And they, they, they just, they're in a state of advanced excitement for hours every day. They take a nap and they get a snack, right? Yeah. But they have to because they die. Yeah. And, and, you know. The energy level is extraordinary. You yeah. know, and, and, and the thing is, they are grasping things. It's extremely active. And they're doing it together. Right. And that's that's how we learn. Right. I mean, yeah, uh, but in Mrs. Raritan's class, you know, you come in and you're taught how to go to school. Yeah. That's the that's what you learn in kindergarten. The late Mrs. Drew did the same with my children. And I marveled every day yeah, how at, to sit, how to raise hands. And if you, you know? smile before Christmas, you'll cry through the spring. That was her rule. <laughs> she smiles uh, right away. <laughs> I want to give the number out again. If you want to support this effort, and it's really the time. This is the creation moment. Everything has been primary to this. Now the secondary moment is that with Arizona and West Virginia and Iowa soon to follow, Ohio is soon to follow with backpack funding. Classical schools are going to are going to spring up. Charter schools, public schools, but they're going to be charter schools all over the country, and we need your help. We need you to make a donation. 888-437-3941. 888-437-3941. I'll do it again for the Steelers fans. 888-437-3941. Or go to hillsdale.edu slash townhall, one-to-one -one match. You get $10, $10 is matched. If you want to ask a question, pound, uh, star three, star three. Edward Warnick from Morgan, West Virginia, Hello, Edward. You're on with Dr. O'Toole and Dr. Arndt. As a school, former school superintendent, uh, one of the concerns I always had was finding teachers that would be coming from universities with some kind of consistency in training. Uh, that's a problem. I heard one of your panel members saying when looking for a history teacher, they look for history majors. And we've had a lot of research, and a lot of universities have gone to five-year programs whereby you must have a degree, an undergraduate degree in science, in math, in history, music, art, and so forth, and then move into the educational realm. But we need some kind of a national standard to make sure pedagogically teachers are taught how to teach and how the cognitive process works in our society. Uh, curriculum content is important. And we need that good curriculum that you're talking about. But we need to train teachers better in the learning process. Uh, phonetics and reading uh, has to be taught through phonetics. It can't be done through whole language uh, uh, system or whole language approach. Let's get so let's I'm get their input on that. Opinions on yeah. Let's go to that because I have a very strong opinion, but I'm uneducated on this. Uh, Dr. Arn first, and then Dr. O'Toole. How about teachers? Do they have to be trained? Uh, well, they, they, they have to learn. Uh, they have to, I mean, first of all, if you have learned a thing, in principle, you can teach it. Now, the gentleman is very right. The first year is the devil. And it's better if you've got some instruction. How, just how to do that, right? How to run the classroom, how to keep the kids interested. But good teachers, for some reason, well, it's, it's not even a mystery, uh, Hillsdale kids, you know, they're, they're, it's a top college, hard to get in, everybody works hard, right? They nearly die their first year of teaching. After that, it's easier. It's always hard, but it's easier, right? Because you get some skill at that job, and that is a job. And, and you know, I mean, we love, we love to beckon people to remember the great teachers they've had. Remember for a minute the bad ones you've had. 
<laughs> Let's go on the former. I, I, I can remember my Latin teacher in ninth grade walking in, lift, throwing his chalk up, and then de- uh, uh, doing declension, us iomo, iso arm, iso sis. And I just remember that because he just did it with authority, with a lot. He was alive to it. Uh, and I don't know that you can put that in by education, can you, Dr. O'Toole? I mean, isn't that born? Well, you've got to, you've got to have the inclination and the ability to teach. But the experience of teaching in year one is very difficult and it's helpful if you have some training. And so we provide that. When we work with a school, we we do a two-week in-service for the school in its first year to get those teachers up to speed. Uh, And then they come to Hillsdale and we go to them for regular conferences, regular professional development to help them you know, refine the the craft of teaching and specifically the teaching this curriculum. I'm so glad you used that word. I was going about to use that word. It's a craft. It's a, yeah. And every craft can be improved upon no matter the skill level that you have by repetition until your skills begin to decline. Yeah. And that's where the teacher is awfully late in life. They can teach into a long period of life. Let's go back to the to the uh, phones. Again, to donate to this effort, 888 437 3941 Go to hillsdale.edu slash townhall as well. One for one match. I want to remind everyone, if we don't get to you, and there are lots of you, there are tens of thousands of you listening, stay on the line at the end, leave your question. People will be back to you. More than 70 charter schools with 15,000 K through 12 students in 27 states. It's going to be double that next year. Thanks to your generosity, I'm sure. Pamela Brigman from St. Petersburg, Florida, has a question about curriculum in public schools. Pamela, you're on with Dr. O'Toole and Dr. Arne. Oh, thank you so much for taking my question. I really appreciate it. I am not a teacher. I am 61 years old and a retired nurse in oncology, but my best friend is a ninth grade English teacher at a public school about three hours uh, east of me. She's teaching honors English and um, has been a teacher for a long time. And in that class at her school, uh, they they are teaching uh, critical race theory, and my friend was shocked because you know DeSantis, Governor DeSantis, put, made a law that no critical race theory would be taught in any Florida public school, but it is being taught. And my friend was told by the principal, "You will not assign. None of the teachers are allowed to assign homework. That the." the the, they can only read certain things, and she's just mortified, and she hates it, but she needs a job, and she doesn't know what to do. Do you call the you know attorney general in the state? How do you, how do you report it? I mean, you know, um, Doctor O'Toole, awful. what do, what do you do? Completely disrespectful. Yeah, that's they how, take that... their cell phones and they record her. Yeah, you know, that is a hostile environment, and it's a difficult, but it's the reality for many public school teachers, isn't I think, it? I think the public school system is full of of teachers like your friend who are, you know, they got into it because they really cared about kids. Maybe they had a wonderful teacher or a wonderful experience in college, and they thought, I love learning. I want to teach this thing that I truly love and understand to more kids. And I think public school teachers are feeling frustrated and confined by high-stakes standardized testing, by pay raises attached to their children's, their students' performance on these tests. They, they feel like they have to teach only to the test. And then they feel like curriculum is handed down to them, and curriculum is changed year after year after year. Uh, you know, And so there, there's not a chance for them to really become expert at it before the, the, the game is changed on them. Teachers in Hillsdale schools are given a tried and true curriculum that does not change and doesn't need to change because we're confident in it. It's the great works of the Western tradition, and it's the best way to teach mathematics and the best way to teach phonics. And if you teach in an environment like that, you can spend 10 years, 20 years of your life reading Ninth grade literature in our school would be Homer's Iliad, Odyssey, Shakespeare's Roman plays. You can read those over and over again Many happily do, for happily. 10 years yeah. and learn more from it yourself and become better at teaching it. 
Well, Dr. Rod, this is not a political show. We are not a political process. But I would point out, Mike Pompeo today tweeted out, the number one threat to the United States is not Chinese Communist Party. It's not Iran. It's Randy Weingarten. And she took up the challenge. Now, I don't want you to comment on, on the former Secretary of State's throwdown or her response. But that clearly goes to your oft-made point that fundamental things are afoot. Oh. There is a collision underway. Look, if you're, the word education means leading forth. And I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, it's w one of the things that, uh, yeah, stick with me. All right. Now that you learn something new every year, I'm leading for it. If uh, uh, what we say to the kids is what we say to the future, and that is deeply controversial. And the, 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 huh. the, re the, the last caller, the last two have both been spectacular, by the way. Thank you both. Um, she's saying that this woman is being driven by a centralized, you know, we want, we're turning America into a controlled experiment. And, and that means that experts, starting with Harvard and going on down, Lord, you went to Harvard. Um, I had Harvey Mansfield, so it didn't hurt. <laughs> it, everything is centralized, right? But the truth of the matter is, I, I read that quote from Winston Churchill, everybody should glory in the greatest things written and said down through time. And the thing about critical race theory is that's all just right now, right? You never, you, you never get a chance to step outside. It's like you're being educated by the New York Times. And that's not the way to be educated. If, if, you, get, if you study the great works, I mean, Socrates had a student in Plato. Socrates didn't write anything. Plato had a student in Aristotle. Now, those two guys are as good as there ever was. Uh, book one, chapter three of Aristotle's Ethics takes up an issue with Plato, his teacher, right? And that means that when you read these great works, you'll look at things from every possible point of view in a way that encourages you to try to figure them out. And you will break it down, and you will figure it out, yeah. which is why you are educated. Uh, let's go back to the phones, because uh, we're in Wichita, Kansas. I talked to your legislator this morning, Clint Davis, or Davis Clint, I think it's Clint Davis, uh, calling us. You are on the line. Remember, press star three to ask a question. Live caller, Clint Davis. Welcome. You're on with Dr. O'Toole and Dr. Arndt. The question I have is um, we have three uh, uh, conservative uh, school board members right now and if uh, I run and get elected and we maybe get another one, we may have, we may have a majority, four or five. Uh, and so what I would like to know is how can you help a public school board implement a Hillsdale uh, American K-12 educational system? Select a superintendent, call hire and two, train teachers and implement an excellent curriculum, or is it possible? Boy, this is a big question. We can help. We can help. We're, we're helping a public school district in Idaho right now. Uh, the first thing we can do without any further ado is point you to the 1776 curriculum. It's, um, you know, decades of scholarship on American history and civics put into lesson plans and primary source documents and sample tests and quizzes for K through 12 students to study American history and then later government and civics. Uh, and you can download that right now and your district can adopt that and use that for the teachers. Um, the teachers, I think, will love it. It, it gives them the autonomy that, that they should want and I think do want when they're excellent teachers. It gives them guidelines, not a script to read. And all of the things that they need to craft amazing lesson plans are right then and there. Brent, I, I want to add, go fast, go far, and I want to ask Dr. Arn about the superintendent question, because this is actually coming up all across the United States where very, very important changes have been made at the school district level. Voters have demanded change. So the first thing you have to do is dismiss a superintendent and find a new one. Where do you find the new one? Well, it's, uh, you know, it, just remember, uh, w we think too much of expertise. Yes. More important than expertise is want to, right? So anybody who's got a knack for running a railroad and an, and an, and an education can do that job. It, you know, it, it, we have to get back to the idea, by the way, that anybody can do 
anything they want to do. You know, because that's America, right? And and you know, if it's beyond them, then they probably won't want to do it for very long. But not very many things are beyond people. I, I have a suggestion, and I'm not the educator here. The doctors are the educator. But the fetching Mrs. Hewitt, my wonderful wife of 40 years, went to Fallbrook Unified High School, which was operated by a Marine Corps colonel and which had three Marine Corps colonels on the staff. They had no discipline problems. The Marine Corps colonels ran a classroom, and they knew how to run because they'd run platoons in combat. And they had to get accredited now. They wouldn't have had to get accredited in the 70s. What do you think about people who are making transitions, Dr. O'Toole, from other fields to go and teach? Do they need masters? Do they need PhDs to be teachers and superintendents or can they, they need to know the subject they're going to teach and they have to love kids and they have to be able to explain well to kids to be a superintendent though i was getting specifically oh, your superintendent to i think your superintendent is the principal in the district who the teachers love the most i think that's the danger of the education bureaucracy oh, is that we get we get far we get further and further removed from the classroom right and the the people at the top we have the statistics actually on the rise of of um, hiring of non-teacher and non-principal education personnel, and it's, the numbers are staggering. I'll, su I'll summarize the numbers I have memorized. Yeah. Since 2000, number of students, students in public schools have grown 7.5%, number of teachers in public schools has grown 8%, and number of administrators in public schools have grown 92%. So that's so. who are those people, right? Who are those, those people? Those are those people who are telling the principals – you know, this is the report that's due. You need to do this data crunching. You need to do this boom, 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 right? And so the, the job of the principal, the challenge of the principal is to mentor the teachers and to bring the faculty together and to ensure that the curriculum is being, you know, happening and it's alive in the classroom and everything's lined up properly and the teachers are masters of their craft. And you, you, in other words, the principal should be focused on the classroom. So the superintendent should be the teacher, the principal about whom the teachers have the highest regard? Yes, because because if if you if you can get people at the top who are who know what it is to be a teacher, That's which a lot of them nice. don't, uh, and you can you know get them so that they're pointing their attention down into the classroom and helping the people in the classroom do their work rather than fill out whatever report that everyone up here is caring about, then we can start retaining better teachers, attracting better teachers, and, you know, actually get some traction going. You need to get, so, as you know, Winston Churchill was a very great man, and he wrote an aphorism that's the best management advice I've ever read. Uh, I was asked this by an MBA on the search committee to be the president of Hillsdale College, and I have in round number 700 employees. Do I do their work for them? I just remember this. It is the safeguard and the glory of mankind that it is easy to lead and hard to drive. Yeah. So, so when I hire somebody, I, I always ask the same question. I always work around to tell me, what do you love? What, what, what drives you? Right? And that they, people always answer that question with enthusiasm. And for the most part, accurately. How could I have known it easy to lead and hard to drive? When did he say that? In what the context? And how come you've never told me that before? Well, that's in an essay that we're going to read on the Hugh Hewitt show. Okay. Your, your education is taking a long time, but we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. It, uh, no, it's in Mass Effects in Modern Life. And it's just, I, you know, I had this MBA guy who was on the search committee to hire the president of Hillsdale College, which I had decided I might try to do. And he said, how'd you learn how to manage? And I said, well, various ways. One of them doesn't matter. And he said, what? And I said, Peter Drucker used to be my landlord. He's, he's the inventor of modern. Yes, yes. And, you know, he's a wonderful man. I just never studied with him. I just knew him well for a long time. Wow, he said. I said, no, that doesn't matter. I said, I learned to do it by making mistakes and not making them again if I could. If I could. But then also Winston Churchill summarized the whole thing. And it is the whole thing. It's By the way, it, everybody in life has a station, and that's their station. At Hillsdale College, my station is to teach, which I teach just like the rest of them, and they're my classrooms, and I run them. But my station is to supervise, right, which is not the same thing as doing the work. No, it's leading. It's and, it's, leading. and it's mostly 
helping people to do their job when they need it. Yeah. And that, and then if you if you do things like uh, like here's the thing that happens all the time. Uh, if you write me a letter, even a dirty letter, it will be opened by a student. I get hundreds of letters a week, you know, and it'll be opened by a student and they'll read it first and they'll decide what to do with it. And they compose answers if somebody I don't know. I look at them. Anyway, uh, once in a while they'll come in and say, how do you want me to do this? And I always say, successfully. <laughs> And they, and they look up a minute and they say, they realize, this is your job. If you have a specific question, I will help. But I don't know how to do it. You're going to have to do it. You see, that's, and teaching is the same, right? Yeah. Like beloved bosses are people who admire the people who work for them and help them. And help them along. And expect them to do their jobs. And want them to stay and want them to actually rise. I, I need to go to Cincinnati. By the way, hit star three to ask a question. The phone number to call to make a donation, which will be matched dollar for dollar, 888 437 When you go online to hillsdale.edu slash townhall, at 888-437-3941 or hillsdale.edu slash townhall. I have to take this question because it's from Cincinnati, Ohio, which is almost in Ohio. Megan Folan is calling in. <laughs> Good evening, Megan. We're going to make, we're going to consider Cincinnati part of the Buckeye State for this purposes of the <laughs> Well, you know what? I went to college in Kentucky, so it there would be go. okay with me if you push me a little further south. There you go. Um, I have two high schoolers, and I cannot tell you how excited I am that Cincinnati um, is opening, well, just opened this past school year, a Cincinnati Classical Academy. Um, I had called for several years kind of requesting one, and I'm, I wasn't the only parent locally really looking to open one in Cincinnati. Unfortunately, it was not open in time to service my kids, considering I have a ninth grader and an 11th grader. Um, for years and years, obviously, actually before my kids were even in school, um, I've been doing what I considered homeschooling. We called it after schooling, where I would try to supplement what I thought my kids weren't getting in their education. Um, and so my question is, what can parents like me who don't have access, my kids are a little bit old, on the older side, didn't have access to a classical um, academy education. I did what I could to supplement. What other resources before I turn them loose on the world can I do as a parent to supplement their education and give them what they need to be successful in college, but most importantly, to be successful adults? Well, there's a ton of stuff. If you go to K-12 at home, K-1-2-A-T-H-O-M-E dot Hillsdale dot E-D-U, you'll see that we're putting things there for parents like you. These are you know, parents who can't get their children into a classical school or parents who want to homeschool and need resources. You'll see book lists, lists of books that we read in the curriculum. You'll see videos about how to teach specific topics in the curriculum. Uh, you can download the entire 1776 curriculum and get the entire history and civics sequence, which goes all the way up through high school. That would be a great thing to do for your kids. Um, What's that web address again, Dr. O'Toole? It's K12, K12, at home, A T H O M E, dot Hillsdale, dot E D U. K12, at home, dot Hillsdale, dot E D U. And that's our resources for parents of children in school or homeschooling. Fabulous answer. I You're going to put videos there, right? There are videos there. Also, I think you should offer this woman a job. I think so too. <laughs> She's gone now. now Send me we're an email. Go. The next person in line hits star three to ask a question. Hans, Hans Kuk in Orlando. I hope I'm saying Kuk correctly, Hans. Welcome. You're on with Dr. R and Dr. O'Toole. Well, thank you. Um, quick question. Uh, for the Hillsdale Charter Schools, how are teachers evaluated? How do you do that? Oh, that's great. It's a great question. A lot depends on teacher evaluations. So the first thing is it's frequent. Frequent observations, right? As the as the principal, you are in the hallways all day, every day, stopping in on classes and checking in on the teachers. Uh, you need to know what's going on in your school. And what's going on in your school is going on in classrooms, not on spreadsheets. Do you teach teachers not to resent that, but to welcome it? Well, if you, yeah, we teach the, yeah, we, yes, we do. Um, and it's, it's a little scary at first being observed, but after a while, you, the teachers really learn to appreciate it because they think of teaching as a craft and it's helpful to have another adult just take a look for 30 minutes and say, oh, you know, by the way, 
you know, your handwriting was a little small, or it would have been helpful if you had put an outline of what you were talking about on the left side of the board before you started lecturing. They have to believe you're not there to hurt them. Right. They have to believe, you know, they, they have to think of you as a fan who also wants to get better. You see, my experience is with ABA accreditors, and they are there for an ideological agenda. It's all a community. So the, it's a community. It's a reg they're regulators. They are regulators. My people are regulators. Your people are coaches. Yeah, this is the Anybody principal. Out this there is the leader the of the faculty. Resist every impulse to be a regulator. Right. Like at Hillstock College, we don't like rules. Every year I, rep I repeal more rules than we make. We used to have 130 pages of student rules. Now we have 17 rules. They take up a page and a quarter, and I'm working on getting them down to a page. Because goals are the thing, right? And if they don't accept the goals, you can't work with them. But if you get the goals clear, then when you go in, into their classroom, you're there to help them reach the goals. Okay, well, I want to go back to Hans, because he said that's part one, observe. What's part two? Frequently. And then the the criteria that you're using for, for observing are common sense criteria. So the first question that I used to ask when I was observing teachers is, who's in charge? When you walk into the classroom, who's in charge? It's either the students or the teacher. If it's the students, it's not good. It should be the teacher. So that's the first thing. As a teacher, you should be in charge. Was, the, was it clear what the teacher was trying to teach, yes or no? Was the teacher effective at teaching what he or she was trying to teach? Yes or no? Do you teach principals this? Do you yeah. gather them together? This is what we do in our principal training, yeah. And it's teachers love it, right, because it's the same criteria for every teacher in advance. That's a breath of fresh air. It's not – it's it, it's clear, it's common sense, it's easy to do, and it's obviously what you should be doing if you are a if you are a teacher. And then the principal is the one who's helping everyone do a great job at the thing that they've chosen to do because they love it. And the relationship between the principal and the faculty as a whole is collegial and friendly, and we're all boosting each other up. That's right. what you get in the best ones. Uh, Charlotte is our next live caller. Again, hit pound three, or, or excuse me, star three to ask a question, to make a donation, 888-437-3941 to you tens of thousands of people who are listening to the Tell Out Town Hall tonight or watching it later in the day. That phone number will be available, 888-437-3941. Hello, Charlotte. You're on with Dr. Arn and Dr. O'Toole. Hi, um, thanks for taking my call. I had a question. Um, I'm currently in college to um, be an elementary ed teacher, and uh, I was wondering what your charter schools do when there are kids in the class, in like the general class, who have like learning disabilities or they're like English language learners, um, just not your like who need extra support, but they're still in the the typical class. Yeah, charter, charter schools do the same thing, provide the same services for students on 504s and IEPs and students with uh, who are learning English. I, I don't know what a 504... 504, those are um, learning plans for students with disabilities. Okay, an individual assessment plan? Education I, plan. Okay, IEP, IEP is an individualized okay. education plan. So those are, the, those are the plans that you have if you have a learning disability, and it could be a a mild learning disability or a more severe learning disability, charter schools serve all of those students uh, along with regular education students, we call them. Now, we're, we think that teaching is really important. And in my experience, the best special education teachers are the best teachers. They're really, really thoughtful about exactly how something needs to be taught to this student and what the mind of the student needs to be able to do in order to grasp it. And they're the type of people who can see, oh, this child has um, a, a learning disability in mathematics, for example. And I can look at the, the child's report, and I can judge from that report and from working with the child exactly how that child can be taught. When special education goes well, as it does in our schools, it's just excellent teaching. And the special education teachers actually have a lot to teach uh, regular education teachers about, you know, the brain and about the way that these um, different disabilities work. And so, yes, um, it, these are schools for everyone. 
something. I'm so glad you said that. Now, we are all Californians here in lesser or larger part, Dr. Arn, Dr. O'Toole, and me. So I like getting Nancy Cherney calling from Novato, California, though I don't know where Novato is. Uh, a question about California specific. Hello, Nancy. You're on with Dr. O'Toole and Dr. Arn. Uh, it's a great honor to be talking with all of you. Um, so I live in Marin County, which is an extremely liberal part of an extremely liberal state. And charter schools are under attack in California. They don't want to really let more charter schools into California. But as a concerned citizen whose child has already graduated um, from college and, and all of that, how can we as concerned citizens help our public school principals superintendents and teachers to grab onto and teach the curriculum of Hillsdale when they're being forced to do some version of CRT and some version of Common Core, which are both uh, attacking our California public schools in mass. Yeah, well, I think your school board elections are going to be really important. Um, I think that I think that people need to remember that teaching, what to teach and how to teach it are essential questions. And the answer to those questions is not, as you say, it's not rocket science. <laughs> like we, we know what the best things to study in K through 12 are. That's a limited number of years. You should study the best things. We should not be using those years to experiment with the latest and greatest and most politicized stuff. So yeah, I think I think my translation of, of your question is, what do I do to help the locals? And it's to give them courage is to encourage them. I mean, you go to them and say, I will support you. I will come to your meetings. I will speak on your behalf. I will not be angry. I will be supportive of any attempt to embrace classical education. And for those who are inclined to run for school board, Dr. Arn, they ought to. Yeah, yeah, you should. So uh, we, we have a charter school in California in Orange County. It's not the same thing as Novato, but it's not as conservative as it used to be. No, it's getting there. <laughs> uh, it, uh, the, you know, it. it I, I think the key to American politics, speaking as a political scientist for a minute, is what do people love the most? Uh, they love their families and they love their work. Especially in in their families, they love their children, and so there are battles going on all over the country. Who owns the children? And so you're just going to have to take that battle to school board elections. And, you know, I mean, it's, you know, the facts about children are very simple to understand. Human babies take a very long time to grow up, and you get more after they do. And, and then somebody's got to care for them. And there's a natural love of the people who conceive and bear them for the child. That has to be the staple. And that means no human being gets to own any other human being ever. But uh, parents are appointed by nature to look after the children while they're minors. They should have the whip hand. And my admonition to every school board member is not to go to your National Association of School Board Members conference and not to be led by your superintendent of schools and not to be given direction, but to remember who sent you and who elected you and what you ran on. Because this new wave of school board members ought to be calling you. They ought to be besieging you, Dr. O'Toole, for help because they're not, they're being elected to change things, right? They're being elected to change it. Jamie Britton has a question about state standards. Again, press star three to ask a question. Jamie, you're on with Dr. O'Toole and Dr. Arn. Hi. Um, <clears throat> this, you touched on this a little bit ago, but like the current school, charter schools that you have now, how are they teaching classically and also satisfying state standards that the state standards are often at complete odds with the classical education? They're teaching CRT and SEL and those kind of things. Well, by definition, the state standards are general. And the curriculum that we provide and the lesson plans that the teachers put together because of the curriculum that we provide is specific. We don't go into a state where the standards prevent us from doing the mission. So we do an alignment and we we take stock of it and we have not found a state in which 
it is not possible to teach this curriculum and remain faithful to the law, which is what public schools must do. And you're in 27 states. 27 states. That's right. Um, I can speak from experience. I, I started a school in Texas. Um, the Texas standards were at the time, and I think still are, pretty good. Um, but they don't, they don't tell you what to say in the classroom. They tell you what students need to be able to do at the end of your, of your year with them. And so there's a lot that the, that the standards don't ask. And standards, by definition, are uh, minimum standards, right? They, because they have to apply to every public school in the state. Uh, we find that in our schools, we easily meet and exceed the standards. We don't just teach what's required by law. We do a lot more on top of How that. does it relate to Common Core? Many years ago, that was a flash topic. It was sort of the beginning volley in the education conflict in the United States was the introduction of Common Core, which was widely and quickly understood to be indoctrination and bad teaching. So how does the classical standard comport with the Common Core? Common Core is not great, um, and the standards are weak. But because our curriculum is so much stronger and more robust and more deep than those standards, we do operate in many common core states. We just don't merely do that. I see. So that's the the, the floor, and you aim to Let be me, the floor. Uh, we, we, have a, we have many wise people at Hillsdale College, and one of them is wise about that very subject you're asking. His name is Dan Copeland, and he's the yeah. dean of our new Master's of Classical Education program. And he has written some sample state standards. There's nothing wrong with state standards. They should be general and achievement oriented. That is to say, what should the student be able to do? He wrote, uh, when Mike Pence was governor of Indiana, uh, he wrote for Mike Pence standards for four grades, and they took up four pages. Yeah. And you know, if, if the kids could do almost all of the things on those four cages, pages, They'd be well educated. So he translates the educrat bureaucraties into simplicity. Yeah. You know, and that's and another thing is you no no rules, right? I hate rules. It's a bad idea. Madison writes, if the laws laws are so voluminous and changeable that no one can remember what they are, then no matter how they're made, they're not laws, right? And so you know, it's got to be a six-inch fat three-ring binder, or it's not serious. Nobody, nobody does things like that. Nobody, no, nobody. Only Democrats do. What is this master's in classical education of which you speak? Well, we, you know, we've got this crazy thing going on, right? We, uh, we don't take any money from the government, so we never get any money from these charter schools. And we're doing several million dollars. I'm glad you made that point. I was supposed to make that point. Thank you. You, do, you do not have a relationship financially with these schools. S several million. Well, well, we do. We spend a lot of money on yeah, it. You do, but they don't give you money. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. we, uh, we, we, you know, we spend several million dollars a year doing this. Thank you, the great people who make that possible. And, and we, we uh, so, and we're, we're good partners, right? Because... We, we only want them to be great. Uh, we don't have the power to tell them what to do. We make a contract with them. We will spend time and money on you and give you this curriculum where you can have it for free without a contract, and we will help you do it. But you have to agree to try to do it. And that way, everybody in the relationship is a volunteer. And, you know, uh, come, come to the campus in the summer there are hundreds of teachers all summer long. I'm never invited to Hillsdale in the summer. I'm only invited the depth of winter, as you know. That's because we're worried about your character. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me about this master's in classical education. Oh, What's yeah, okay. So now, you know, we need people to run schools. Yes, I was wondering if that's it. And, uh, and so what are they learning? Uh, they're learning the stuff we're talking about tonight. And they're getting, you know, you know I'm... I don't have any training in managing, right? And I'm I'm glad uh, the great Peter Drucker was my landlord, but I studied the things he studied. I knew him pretty well, right? I said to him once, management by objective, which is a summary of everything in, invented. I said, that sounds like Aristotle to me. And he put his finger to his lips and went, shh. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to shh everyone now because I want to get to more calls. Rowan Walvord. 
I'm sorry, I butchered that, has a question about what to do to help his 14 grandchildren. He's lapped us combined. Mm. So that's that's a quite a good... R. Wayne, is that what it is? Yes, well, it's Wayne. I go by my middle name, and I'm here in Colorado with 14 grandkids in London, in Virginia, and in the state of Pennsylvania, but my home is Colorado. Well, get them out of Pennsylvania, but your question is, go ahead. What can a grandparent do in attending school board meetings where they do not have a student affect possibly the outcome of the school board criteria to in include Hillsdale College curriculum? Thank you, Hillsdale College, for this telemarketing. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, so first of all, several states have adopted our curriculum substantial, substantially. I heard Ron DeSantis say in a public speech the other day that Florida had. And we've been working with them, you know, and we will help any state or district that wants. And, and you know, it's, it, you know, right now South Dakota is evaluating, you know, it's very controversial. Uh, I talked to the governor, whom I know pretty well, Christy Nome. She's a good woman. And she said, uh, but what do we do about the Native Americans and their special needs? And I said, you know, I happen to have read a book about the Native Americans in South Dakota. It's a noble and wonderful story. Tell that, a tragic story too. Tell that story. That's all you do in, in school. I mean, after you learn reading and writing and arithmetic, uh, Dr. O'Toole said it earlier, then there are two things you need to know. You need to know the story of the human, the human story, and you need the story of the natural world. And those stories are things that are exist, right? You don't make them up. And so in South Dakota, I mean, look up a, a, a man, a Comanche chief. The Comanche were very tough, very tough. And they ruled a significant part of the United States for a long time with a population of 30,000 people. And, and Quanta, who was half white, was the last great chief, and he's the one who made the peace. And then he died as a real estate developer in Colorado. And it's a wonderful story. It's a great story. And he, I... and he, never, he, he, he never shed his Comanche roots there are great stories to be. There are great novels to be read. Michael Punky writes a great novel called Ridgeline about the battle before the battle of, of Little Bighorn. My uh, suggestion to our grandfather is: do not go to a public meeting and make a speech. Instead, call a school board member and ask for an appointment in their office, and bring along the 1776 curriculum and say to them: Are you aware that this group of of pioneers are up there in Michigan? And then, if the school board member calls you, Doctor O'Toole, what will you talk to them about? We'll offer any help that we can offer in the form of curriculum, in the form of teacher training. You know, I have neglected to mention, which is a real problem, um, a book that we have for any teacher that explains the principles of classical pedagogy. And it's a helpful resource for these districts, too. It's called Tried and True. The author is Dan Copeland. Uh, it just came out. He's the head of our education department in this graduate school we've been telling you about. And it's a really handy guide for anyone who is a teacher. This is the kind of thing that a district would find helpful. Tried and true. Tried and true, a primer on sound pedagogy. And it's well, they kind find of that at K-12 uh, at? Yep, found it on our website, k12.hillsdale.edu. And uh, it's, a, it's a small, accessible, easy book that will remind you what the principles of good teaching are and that you can do it if you are a homeschool parent or a classroom teacher. We have time for one more uh, question. I do want to remind people, if you've been inspired tonight to take action, begin with a contribution because it will be matched one for one by calling 888-437-3941. Go online at hillsdale.edu slash town hall. I'll tell you that one more time. And if you have not been gotten to stay on the line, please, this is not a live caller. This is a question from Jim Masite in Colorado Spring who wanted to know, why did we change our teaching methods in the country and quit teaching certain things? Dr. Arndt, you're familiar with this long battle that goes back to the beginning of the last century. Well, we have revolutionized our country in the name of science. So science means techne, art, 
making things. It doesn't mean knowing things, which is the original meaning. And so what we think now is that only experts can do the best job. And we have built, you know, in, for most of American history, the government of the United States, state, federal, and local, didn't consume as much as 10% of the gross domestic product. Now it's over 50%. For most of American history, what was consumed was consumed mostly in localities. Now it's centralized, right? We have centralized the administration of our country. And I've been saying in various ways, and I'll say it again, if you want to know how to run a railroad, the employees are going to run the railroad. You're just going to help them, right? And and so it's the, it's the promise of America. The work of each person is in that person, and they have a right to do it. And this education we're talking about, it, it raises up young people who are prepared to live a fully human life, raising their own families, making their own li living, influencing their own community. And that's it. Let me ask Dr. O'Toole. I'm a young senior citizen, and so I won't see my grandchildren flourish at your age. I won't know how they do. Are you an optimist or a pessimist about American education? I'm an optimist. I, I think that we're in a pretty rough time right now. I think COVID has been really rough on teachers. I think a lot of great people have left the profession. Um, and I think that that was, for many people, the final straw in a long, you know, difficult time. Um, but think about the silver lining. Parents all over the country are now urgently concerned with what their children are learning in school. They're rediscovering the fact that they're the primary educators of their children. Children are being held accountable by their parents. Uh, I speak as a former school principal who was always, always, always trying to get even these really involved charter school parents more interested in what we were teaching uh, so that they could help, you know, at home. Um, and so I, I think that I think that we're seeing with individual families, and I think that we're seeing, you know, in recent election results too, school choice is becoming a big issue for people. And well, I think I, that I bodes say. very well. And I think common, ordinary Americans can be counted on to love their children. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times applies to American education, right? I'm just right. so excited about Arizona, West Virginia, and Iowa and Ohio. By the time we do this next year, Ohio and, and, and Iowa will have joined the ranks of backpack funding yeah. so that $6,000 goes out the door. You can now tutor. You could learn the classical education. You can go down to Arizona and you can open up a tutorial for 10 kids and get $60,000 and run that. Yeah, and, and it's amazing. be good at doing it and enjoy it. And, and see, the accountability, if you do that, will be where it belongs. The parents will decide if the kid comes to you. You see? Yes. And that means that... Better be good at it. You better know what you're doing. You better have a curriculum. You better be in touch with Hillsdale. Right. Yeah. Uh, so let me conclude tonight by thanking Dr. O'Toole and Dr. Arnon, every one of the tens of thousands of you who have been listening. Let me remind you that the uh, Charter School Initiative at Hillsdale, begun by Steve Barney with Dr. Arnon, poking his finger in his chest, oh, those many years ago, goes on through the generosity of tens of thousands of donors, large and small. Please become one of them. Call 888 437-3941, 888-437-3941, or go online to hillsdale.edu slash townhall. Please stay on the line if you didn't have a question answered, if we didn't get you into the queue because we're all somewhat loquacious, then just stick around and leave a message and we will get back to you with that. And I want to conclude by thanking you for your time tonight, for watching, for listening. Dr. O'Toole, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Dr. Arnott, it's mostly a pleasure to be with you. And, and uh, we'll do it again next year. And we'll have four states to talk about, and then eight states, and then 16 states. And may your curriculums flourish and spread. Thank you. Good night, Thank friends. You.